Greetings viewers, welcome back to the channel. Today's video is going to be one that's been kind of uh, highly anticipated by a few of you. This is going to be a review, uh, talking points about my 2019 WRX performance pack. Now, as most of you know, I bought the car back in August of 2019 and I have, as I'm driving right now, 2,770 miles on the odometer. I have not driven this car a lot. I find myself driving my 2002 Outback and my Duramax and basically anything else I own more than this car. Uh, as some of you do know, I did post the car for sale already and I do currently still have it for sale and will sell it if I do have an offer or uh, find a buyer for it. And um, a lot of you are probably wondering why I want to sell it already and uh, what my issues are with the car. Um, is there anything I actually like about the car or is it all bad? So figured we'd take a little time and go over that, talk about my experience with the car so far, the things I really hate about the car, the things I don't dislike too much and uh, my thoughts as a whole on newer Subaru vehicles. So as I was saying I haven't driven the car very much and mainly because I really don't enjoy driving the car. Um, there's quite a few design changes on the newer Subaru chassis that I don't like. Uh, the car is much bigger than the old GD chassis WRX Imprezas. I'm not too big of a fan of the car being as big as it is. That said, me being a bigger, taller guy, it is quite uh, comfortable that it is a taller car, but it is a lot heavier car. Well, not terribly heavy. I believe it's about a four or 500 pound difference between the old chassis and the modern chassis, but still, it is heavier than it used to be. So we'll get into things I don't like right away. And uh, the main thing is the transmission. I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, why do you not like it being a six-speed? That would be the preferred setup because the only other option you have is a CVT at this point. Well, the deal is I hate the gear shift and I hate the clutch, the two main components of the six-speed manual. The things I hate about the gear shift are this is now a cable shifted transmission, whereas the older models were uh, used a rod physically connected metal rods to the shift lever went into the transmission. Gave a really nice, firm, positive feel, especially when you had a short shifter, when you had uh, upgraded shift bushings, etc. The new one is basically a plastic box with some cables hooked to it, and it just feels sloppy and loose, and it's not as confident, inspiring going through the gears and the gear changes are really wide too. I know that there are short shifters for the cable box. I've tried them, not on my car, but I've driven other modern WRXs with short shifters and these add-ons, and it doesn't really do it for me. I can still tell a big difference between the cable shifted transmissions and the old rod shifted transmissions, and I greatly prefer the older chassis setup. Talking about the clutch pedal, I despise the clutch pedal in this car and the whole setup on it. I've been driving manual transmissions since I was six years old. I grew up on a farm. I was driving old Dodge Power Wagons that were three on the tree. I was driving old international tractors that were manual transmission. And I have stalled out this 2019 WRX probably more times since I've owned, in the time I've owned it, than I have stalled manual transmission cars in my entire time of driving. It is embarrassingly bad. I believe current count, I've stalled this car 19 or 20 times. I'm ashamed to admit that, but the clutch pedal is just so mushy in this car. It doesn't have the good firm feedback that the older chassis clutch had. The throttle, the drive-by-wire throttle in this car is really numb too, and it's hard with the stock exhaust, and as quiet as the car is, it's hard to get the RPMs right for takeoff. I'm sure that the heel hold assist is probably to blame for a lot of this. Um, I do like the system, especially when on a heel, uh, but 
I had seen on the forums and stuff people were having issues with stalling out as well and getting used to the clutch and they said that hey turn the hill hold assist off it might help I've driven one with hill hold assist off not this one but a 2018 and I really didn't see that big of a difference that said the 2018's clutch was very firm and felt like a typical Subaru WRX or STI clutch I don't know if my car is defective or I just haven't got the clutch enough miles on the clutch yet for it to firm up but it's just really squishy and numb and feels like an older Honda Civic also with the clutch they've got this super strong return spring on the clutch pedal so when you go to let the clutch pedal out there's a spring wanting to pull the clutch pedal up now the older chassis had something similar to this but the tension on the spring feels like it's just way more on this chassis. That said as well, the older chassis were always higher mileage when I drove them, so perhaps that spring had lost tension and wore due to age and mileage, but don't know because I never really drove any of the GD chassis when they were brand new. Other than that, that's really my main gripes about the car. Um, I don't like the side skirts on the car it is like awkward as heck for me to get in and out of this car i can't tell you how many times i've accidentally uh heel struck my side skirts with the heel of my boot trying to get in and out of the car uh it's kind of awkward how far out you have to swing your foot and leg to not hit the side of the car because you were recessed so deep into it in the driver's seat um, I'll probably take some pictures, add some clips in to show these points as I make them. It's kind of hard to explain just in words, but it's really awkward how wide um, it is trying to exit the car. Um, what other dislikes do I have? None really come to mind, actually. That's my main gripe is the clutch pedal, the transmission shifter, and size of the car, the bodywork, how high, how far out I have to swing my leg just to get out. Those are just, that's a little nitpicky thing. I can live with that, but the, the, the gear shift and the clutch are like real big deal breakers to me. I'm not a fan of it. Um, things I like. I really like the infotainment system. I have a lot of people that have talked crap about the Starlink system, and I know there are a lot of uh, issues with like the Outbacks with their Harman card on. Um, touchscreens going out that was a big issue and like the four, uh, 15 16 models uh, but Subaru's revised that they've changed this system several times I've not had any issues with the radio with um, Android Auto anything of that nature really love the system it's really great the hands-free texting and calling and everything that the Google uh, the program through Google sorry about the camera shake uh, all these back road uh, highways in South Carolina are pretty rough. So hopefully this video is actually usable and not a shaky mess. But um, yeah, I really like the infotainment system. The automatic climate control works as it should. I uh, really like the gauge cluster. Not the actual regular cluster, but the little uh, cluster that's above the radio that gives you, it's kind of like a driver information center. Um, usually I keep it set on the three gauge display for oil temp boost and accelerator, accelerator position or uh, percentage. Uh, that said, I kind of switch between that and the large boost gauge. It's kind of a digitized analog gauge and it shows your peak boost, etc. Um, but other than that, all that stuff I really don't mind. It's not overly technologically advanced for a 2019 model car. There's not too much so in here. Uh, one reason I got the performance pack was no sunroof. I despise having a sunroof in a car, especially after most of you saw my 2014 3.6R Outback. Uh, it was nearly total due to flood damage. Not, well, flood damage caused by the sunroof leaking flooded the inside of the car, not outside water flooded into the car when Hurricane Florence came through. So, not a big fan of sunroofs. I never open them. Don't, and I lose headroom, and you know, I've got to worry about them leaking. So, I'm not at a loss not having the sunroof. I do love these uh, Alcantara Recaro seats from the STI. That was one major selling point to me for getting the performance pack. Love, love, love these seats. Uh, 
me being a bigger guy, I had, well, I used to be a much bigger guy. I used to be 310 pounds, but I'm about 193 to 194 now. Uh, I know back in the day that the older STI Recaros were kind of snug on me, especially in the bolsters. Evo seats were horrible. I couldn't sit in them just because I was so wide and out of shape. The bolsters really dug into my sides and stuff. But that said, these newer style Recaros are extremely comfortable, hold you still, not that I've done really any high performance spirited driving other than, you know, a couple passes here and there on the interstate or something. I've not really, uh, I haven't taken it to the drag strip. I haven't autocrossed it or done any of that stuff. It's basically a, it's basically a long uh, distance trip car at this point, a commuter car. I don't really plan on doing anything to it yet. Once it's out of warranty, if I keep it that long, uh, I'll probably put exhaust on it and take and tune it. Probably not more, probably not much more than that. Uh, as far as the performance, it's okay. I mean, it's 265, 268 horsepower, whatever it's rated at. It's 200 and doesn't even matter because it's 200 and something. I only say that from the standpoint of I've had, you know, 600 horsepower Camaros. I had several Z06 Corvettes. I've driven a lot of high performance, higher horsepower cars in my younger days. So this is it's whatever you know it doesn't it doesn't really do anything for me i didn't buy it for the speed if i was wanting something for the speed i would have waited and bought the s209 or well that's basically your only option for anything that's got any decent power uh <laughs> when it comes to subarus because we're still beating the old ej257 into the ground because Subaru can't make anything more powerful to pass emissions for U.S. market, or at least that's the excuse I've been told. So, kind of going all over the place with this thing. Um, back to things I like. I love the infotainment system. Uh, I love the infotainment system in the car. I like that I have an analog temperature gauge and fuel gauge. I like that it's not super digitized. I prefer analog gauge to the digital. I'm not a big fan of all the newer cars going to like all digital clusters with all digitized analog gauges. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, what else can we say here? Uh, it's got plenty of room in it. That's one thing I do like. I, I'm contradicting myself now because I said I hated that the chassis was bigger, but I love that it's got more room, which kind of goes hand in hand. But yeah, if I need to go to Sam's Club or somewhere, instead of having to take the truck, I can fold down the back seat and uh, basically the trunk entire space opens into the back seat and I've got all the storage uh, space in the world. It pretty much has as much storage capability as my O2 Outback does uh, with its back seats down. Um, uh, you just lose the height from where the deck lid is and the back window as compared to you know the Outback being a hatch. What else can we talk about? Uh, brakes are good. They do rust really easily, but like I said, I don't drive the car super frequently and they are higher. Um, I don't know if the rotors are actually different. I think if I remember right, this performance pack car, the brake upgrade was just in pads. Um, but yeah, no complaints on stopping distance or anything of that nature. Um, what else? Visibility is really good in this chassis. That is another thing I can commend Subaru on. Uh, moving the side view mirrors away, putting the, uh, the smaller A pillars in the car with more glass where you've got more visibility, uh, more visibility out of the back, out of the sides when you're looking over your shoulder. Uh, the fact the headrests actually pivot forward now, that's a great feature, just little things. Um, all the auto dimming glass, the LED interior lights, you know, things that are expected in modern vehicles that are kind of newer to the WRX chassis. Um, some other things that I don't really like. Um, I don't like that in the US market vehicles, you did not get your little change holder. That's been a big feature I've loved on Subarus for decades now. Um, luckily, I was able to order the JDM change holder to replace the just blank fuse panel cover. I just don't understand. It was only like $18 to get it here from Japan. It's like 
how much money are you saving Subaru of America by not giving us a change holder and instead giving us a flat piece of plastic in its place to cover the fuse panel? And there's stuff like that that just angers me. It's like, why did you cheapen the car and take features away that are in the Japanese market car? For You know, it's just pennies and nickels kind of things. Um, FA20 engine, what do I think of the new engine? Um, I'm not a big FA20 fan so far. A lot of you take it or leave it at face value, but we've got a two liter engine and factory, I've seen this car pull right at 20 pounds of boost, all stock tune. And it's making, like I said, 265 or 268 if I recall correctly. Whereas the old EJ205 was, if I recall, 12, 13 pounds of boost, maybe. It might be less than that. It's kind of, I can't remember now. I think for some reason the WRX was around 12 and the STI was around 14. Might be wrong. But still, that car with that amount of boost made like 240, 245, somewhere in there. So it's not but like a 20 horsepower difference for quite a bit more boost and an upgraded uh, valve train, more sophisticated uh, injection, the direct injection, um, the variable valve timing. There's so many more complexities to the FA20 DIT, and it's barely any higher performance than the EJ205. Now, the place that that engine really shines is fuel economy. The EJ205 in a WRX 5 speed, if you were lucky, you could get maybe mid to high 20s on MPGs. Um, I filmed a video about three weeks ago on my on this car. I was commuting back and forth to Sumter, South Carolina, which is about an hour and 30 minute drive, 70 miles from where I live because I was uh, back with Snap-on that week, and I was actually training a new Snap-on dealer. So I was doing an economy run because it was all highway mileage, basically, but I did have two fairly large towns I had to go through with lots of stoplights, so there's some stop-and-go uh, mixed driving in there. But I, I tried to drive as economically as I could, always jumping to a higher gear, staying out of boost, um, keeping the climate control real low, trying not to run the AC compressor, you know, everything I could do to maximize fuel economy to see how good a gas mileage I could actually get out of a six-speed equipped um, FA20 DIT WRX. And I believe, I'll have to go back for my video clips on that, I think at the end of week when I refilled, manually um, calculated, I think I averaged like 30, 1.8 miles per gallon. I believe the information center's estimates were like 33 mpg, but really, really good gas mileage in my opinion for a 260 some odd horsepower, six speed manual, all wheel drive sports sedan. I mean, you wouldn't have thought that that kind of mileage would be. Uh, capable in this car. That said, I believe the car's window sticker, I think Subaru only rates these cars at like 28 or 27 mpg. So to get 30, uh, 132 is pretty impressive in my book. That said, so many people talk about horrible gas mileage in these cars because they can't keep their foot out of the loud pedal and they need their boosty boost. So if you drive the car reasonably like a traditional car, I mean, these cars are fairly economical commuter cars that you can still have fun in when you put your foot down. So I do, I do respect Subaru for, you know, they did improve emissions, they did improve fuel economy and all that, but I just feel like the EJ was a stronger engine. The offset Conrods in the FA20 I see as a big point of weakness. Yes, they're easier to uh, assemble the engine, remove and install the connecting rod and the piston assembly. But um, back to symmetry and balance, the EJ was just more symmetrical and balanced with straight on old school Conrods. 
the FA is just so much more uh, complex with the timing chains and um, you have more, you have less maintenance than the EJ and the fact is you don't have to change a timing belt but you have more complexity and expense whereas now you have a full aluminum timing cover front and rear that you have to seal you have all these o-rings that go between the covers all rtv you know it's just more points of oil seepage and oil leaks that are far more expensive to repair than pulling a plastic cover off and throwing a 60 70 dollar timing belt at or a 250 dollar timing kit I do like that they have an external water pump now that's turned off the serpentine belt. It's far easier to service. That said, if you replace your water pump with the timing kit and the water pumps were cheap enough, you, I never really saw issues with the water pumps. Normally when I saw water pump issues on the EJ series, it was because they neglected to replace it. When they replaced their timing belt, then they would have, you know, a bearing failure and cooling out the weep hole or the gasket would fail with age or something like that. Um, another big issue with the FA20 now is the direct fuel injection. We've kind of stepped back in time. Uh, old vehicles had issues with carbon buildup on the bows. When port fuel injection came in, uh, the port fuel injection really alleviated a lot of those problems because you had fuel injectors spraying fuel, which is a solvent, on your intake valves, and it was constantly cleaning your intake valves. Well, now that we don't have the port fuel injection anymore, we have the direct fuel injection. No longer is that solvent fuel being sprayed on the intake valves, and with the PCV system, we have all the oil mist coming through the intake, and it's just getting on all the valves, carboning up the valves, and we've all heard for years now with the direct fuel injection cars that valve carboning is a pretty big issue. So Subaru has their uh, valve cleaning kit that they sell. It's basically a can of seafoam and a special tool that's basically just a hose that you hook to the intake and run the car and it's supposed to clean the valves. Uh, the more effective method is to take the intake manifold off and do uh, walnut blasting to get the carbon off the valves. Um, but it's just more expense and aggravation, you know, compared to the older EJ series cars or port injected cars. You just didn't have that issue. Um, Toyota's D4S system, brilliant. You have port and direct injectors. You've got port injectors that spray sporadically to keep your valves clean. You've got your direct injector, direct injectors for uh, you know better fuel economy and less fuel waste. So best of both worlds. I wish Subaru could work out. Not now, I'm sure, but maybe a little bit in the future. Now that Toyota's bought, uh, I think 20% controlling asset of Subaru, where they had like 12 point something percent before. Hopefully, they will come to terms and. Uh, Toyo will allow the D4S system to be installed on the newer Subarus and hopefully get rid of the issues with the valve carboning. Uh, we could talk and on and on and on as I'm driving around, but I see we're at 26 minutes. I don't know how long I'm going to make this video. Hopefully I can cut it down for you guys. Basically touch the points I wanted to touch. Overall, the car is decent, but I'm not happy with it, so I'm going to sell it if I can. I don't like the stick shift, don't like the clutch pedal, and don't like having to step out as far as I do, kind of a uh, minimal problem, but uh, the first two are kind of major, things I do like. Uh, fuel economy, really nice fuel economy in the car, the infotainment system, the digitized gauge cluster, the Recaro seats, and uh, the overall look of the car, this really aesthetically pleasing. Um, just my thoughts, uh, any guys in, any of you guys watching, if you have a 15 to 2020, um, what are your thoughts and feelings? Do you agree with what I said? Do you disagree? Uh, is there things that you hate about your 15 to 20 WRX STI did not cover? If so, leave it in the comments below. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a thumbs up, comment, interact any way you can. It really helps out the channel, helps uh, get the video around, get some views, and helps me out. Really appreciate it, guys. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next video.